Clouds covered the country on the 12th of November 2020 after the passing of the first president of Ghana under the Fourth Republic, Flight Lieutenant Jerry John Rawlings. There were many phases of his life, the military phase, the post-military phase where he ruled under a democratic government, and then his life as a retired statesman. Depending on what who experienced, many have given their versions of testimonials of the late statesman. You're watching Ghana Web's memorial series in honor of Mr. Rawlings. My name is Wanda Amihagan, and today I have with me to share his experience, Mr. Fifi Kweti. I prefer to call him um, the Rawlings boy. Mm -hmm. Welcome aboard, sir, and thank you for and making time to speak with us. It's a pleasure. And, um, you work with the president. At a point, you were his uh, mm -hmm. advisor, yeah. an advisor to the president. That's true. What was your first encounter uh, with Mr. Rawlings like? The very first encounter? The very first. Meaning one on one? Yes. Hmm. The first time you met him. All right. All what right. was that like? Okay, let's say the first time I met him was actually. Uh, in a group. Uh, this was in 92. We had just, um, by the way, in 92, I was then already the chairman of the NDC mm. on the campus University of Ghana. Okay. So we had worked through the election period and uh, won. And then after we won uh, power, he, he decided to actually uh, make us come over to the castle to visit. Okay. So I would say that actually was the first time, uh, but not so much on a one-on-one, -on -one, but more like in a group. Okay. But that really would have been the first time I, I was that, that close to him. That was in 92. And then after that, um, how did you get to meet him personally, one-on-one? -on -one? Uh, I would say that it took a bit because um, what happened in my case in particular was as soon after the elections, uh, I moved into national service, then started working in the private sector. So I was not directly one-on-one -on -one in politics anymore until we lost power in 2000. Mm -hmm. And when we lost power in 2000, I was one of the group of young people who formed a group known as the Youth Forum. Mm -hmm. And this Youth Forum was largely a group of strong combatants on behalf of the party and particularly Rollins. And uh, he started literally hearing uh, more and more about the Youth Forum. And one day decided that he wanted to have a meeting with the Youth Forum. And that was in his office at Ridge. Okay. And in that meeting, I think uh, when I started speaking, I kind of think somebody had hinted him that of the members of the Youth Forum, the one who was most loyal and absolutely much more like fervent about him was mm. me. So I think when I started speaking, subsequent to that, he requested that he wanted us to have a conversation and that really is what it was. So one thing led to the other, we just connected because I had personally been like, uh, uh, he's been a champion from the time I was very young. So for mm. me, that was really like an opportunity to finally work very closely, a man I've really loved uh, virtually from childhood. Before you met him, you mentioned he was a champion to you. Yes. What was uh, your ideal perception of the former president like before you even met him the very first time? Um, let's see this way. That I, growing up, I've always um, had a strong uh, 
believe that somehow we needed to have leaders in Africa who uh, transcended themselves and had genuine aspiration for their people. Uh, and I also happen to have grown up in Avlau and the opportunity of seeing two countries. I saw what was going on across the border in Togo. And then when Rawlings became the leader of the AFRC initially and then subsequently the PNDC, I saw a clear contrast between leadership. Uh, on the other side, I saw what you call what you call the cult of the personality, where an individual is like a god. You needed to worship him. No matter what uh, uh, wrong things were being done, you needed to worship him. On this side, I saw a young man who genuinely just wanted things done well for his country. He was able to have the courage to remain a, left, a flight lieutenant virtually for the whole of his time, even though he was a leader, which was very ahead in Africa, ahead of in Africa. Because in Africa, as soon as you win power, within a matter of a matter of days, you jump from a sergeant to become a general, the highest in the, in the... So for me, those were like things that struck me. So clear contrast in terms of leadership. But above all, I would say, um, I've always been one person who loved people with, with courage, people who speak with charisma, mm. people who are, who are very sacrificial in the way they believe, in the behave. And I would say one statement that marked me and stayed with me throughout my life was the boldness to say, let my men go. I will take full responsibility. For me, that was a, it's a defining moment for me. Any individual who is able to show that capacity to be courageous, that sacrifice, readiness to die and let people go, I would die for that person. So for you, that perception you had when you were young stayed mm. throughout till his demise? Uh, it didn't change at a, any point? Uh, that, that never would have changed because th that is the quintessential uh, Rollins. Mm. Uh, he, he, he's somebody who truly believes in what he believes and he goes after it completely. Uh, but of course, I mean, he's a human being. Uh, so over time, I mean, you clearly will see things that, like every other human being will have. So I wouldn't say I agreed every single thing, every single thing that he, he, he stood for, no. But that genuine principle, that capacity to stand for what he believed and ready to die for, that, for me, stayed throughout. And I would say it's the, it's the quintessential thing about, about, about him, as far as I'm concerned that capacity to stand for his principles, yes. Yeah. How close were you to the former president? Uh, I would say um, the thing about the former president is once he knows you genuinely love him and you are genuinely loyal to him, he basically opens himself up completely. I would say, <laughs> I don't want to boast, but... Uh, uh, absolutely was super super close super close to him so like a relationship yeah very much very my father's son sometimes big brother uh younger brother uh mentor mentee so many of, of that but we were really very close close also not just because of the politics uh it was also because at a certain level i would say uh, we connected beyond just politics we connected at a certain He's a very spiritual person. People do not know that. Mm -hmm. A lot of people don't know. Maybe because you don't see him uh, clutching Bible and jumping from one puppet to another and so on. But he's a very spiritual person. And so even at that level, I felt a very strong connection because I'm naturally also pretty intuitive and very spiritual. So mm -hmm. that was a level at which we, we connected a lot, a lot as well. Okay. Mm -hmm. And the uh, perceptions, or there's been suggestions that the former president wasn't someone who kept relationships or friendships or associations for a very long time. Mm -hmm. Because some people who even helped him get mm -hmm. into power during the military regime and all, he forsook them at certain points. Okay. Uh, was this um, the same in your case? Did you notice anything like that um, in your work with him? You know, I. I it's, it's not life life is a journey and along the journeys you you meet different people at different stages and uh, those people play roles at that particular moment uh, i don't particularly believe that uh, life is a journey where you're supposed to maintain friendships necessarily for life you understand uh, in my case i would say we we work very very closely all the way to when I moved into office to become uh, a deputy minister for finance, things were not necessarily that close again after that. 
for a number of reasons. Some of them have to do with the general internal politics in the NDC. Mm. Uh, because again, I'm like him. I'm pretty much very, um, very to the point. Very to the point. I'm not a hypocrite. Mm. When I believe in something just like him, I'm very forthright. And I think that's one of the reasons why we connected very well. And he always knew that about me. Uh, we had one basic difference, and that difference was when Mrs. Rowling decided to stand for, for, for leadership. I was not for it. And, okay. I was, and I wasn't, I didn't hide it at all. I was pretty straightforward about it. And naturally, uh, that's his wife. You can understand that. So if uh, somebody that close to him like myself, I don't go along that naturally, it's not very easy. But uh, I prefer that I needed to be straightforward and honest about that. Because as far as I'm concerned, uh, President Mills at the time was the leader and mm. we needed to back him. And so I was clearly very, um, open about it that I was not supporting the candidature of uh, Mrs. Rollins. And, and how uh, did he take that? Ah, you can understand. Resistance. You can understand. I mean, uh, it's, your, it's, your, it's, your, it's, your, it's your partner. So naturally, you want all your close friends and associates to come along mm. with you. Did you ever but, have a conversation about I was, it? Yeah, I was, quite, I was quite frank about it. What I said was that um, disagreement is not the same as disloyalty. Okay that no matter how close we are, we can have disagreement. And in fact, that will not even be the first time we have had that disagreement. We, I remember plainly, for example, in the emergence of uh, uh, then vice candidate Mahama uh, to become Rani Met. Initially, President Rollins was strongly for, for, for John Mahama. And of course, we were together on that score. Then along the line, he drifted um, towards uh, uh, Betty Moore de really because at the time Mrs. Rollins was switched from JM so moved to Betty Mould and somehow the husband went along with her mm -hmm. and some of us were like sir no we, we have to stay with John Mahama so of course that also brought its own difficulty but as I said life is made up of some of those things but fundamentally principles must remain where they are and uh, for me uh, those initial principles for which I, I love him uh, those have remained until until he's passing. Because for me, at the end of the day, that whole matters mm. most. Differences will happen and go, but core principles must remain. And it's a sacri it's a man who absolutely loves his nation, loves his people. Uh, it's a great, great, great human being. Uh, beyond the politics and all, it's one of the, m the greatest human beings you can ever have. Faithful, loyal to a fault. I think to a certain extent, one of his biggest weaknesses is that when he really trusts you, he trusts over trust. And uh, for people and people who do not love him that much back, sometimes took advantage of that level of trust and sometimes m misled him. Mm. Because he's a, he's a truthful person. So he assumes once you are close, you are truthful. But not everybody who was close was that truthful. So I think some people took advantage of his greatness and his love and devotion to people who are close to him. And somehow, I think, naturally did not always tell him the truth. And, uh, uh, I think the kind of person he was, what he deserved at all moments, is that capacity to tell him the truth, no matter uh, uh, how, how much disagreement that, that, that would bring. Sure. I'd want you to go more into details about the persona of the, the former president. But before that, when was the last time you saw him before his passing? Uh, the last time we saw, we met us at, uh, in fact, twice, during, during the mother's um, uh, uh, funeral. Burial. First, we went to the house. Mm -hmm. I mean, to commiserate with him. Then, of course, the burial ground, the burial day itself. Uh, that really was the last one. After that, um, uh, we as well move into so much of the politicking as well, prepare, preparing for the campaign for the and so on. So, uh, I, did not, I did not have the privilege of meeting him. Yeah, but and you didn't even sp um, speak on phone. As in direct conversation yes. on the phone. Oh, normal. Before he passed. Normal. Uh, uh, um, like a test message, I think that was also so in the way. I, I think there was an instance where basically a, set, a test message sent. That, that that's about it. But in terms of the direct passing, no. So you wouldn't know if uh, the late president was sick or anything of the sort before. You 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 must also appreciate that uh, issues of illness tends also to be a bit. Uh, it's not something always you always you always want to know it's about. So as much as possible, these things are normally will be kept in very very close circles around him, because once it leaks out, it becomes public information. And if you watch what, what really happened in terms of this particular one, it was kept pretty much very 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 close. 
uh, we needed to respect some of that, those private sensi sensibilities. These are very close family issues. So, uh, but of course, his condition is not a condition that was unknown. Uh, basically, uh, he's, he's had recurring issues. But of course, all of us who have known him and especially love him always believe that he's, uh, he's naturally as strong as a horse and he was going to hang in there. But, uh, uh, God, man, man proposes, God disposes. Mm. Mm. We'll come back to the conversation. Uh, we want to take a quick break. You are still watching the memorial series um, in honor of the late former president, Jerry John Rawlings, here on Ghana Web TV. We'll be right back. and principalities. There's so much fire inside me. Tragedy struck when part of the largest hillside at the kosher rubbish dump collapsed. Welcome back. Before the break, we were talking about um, his experience with the former president, and we have been speaking to um, Mr. Fifi Kwete, who was a very close ally to the former president. So I know there was the whole campaign period and people preparing, but nobody saw this coming. Yeah. What was the first thing that came to mind, or how did you? act when you heard about the news. Even before that though, where, where did you hear it from? Did anyone from the family call you? How did you hear the news? You know, like, I mean, we are pretty much in, a, in an age where every now and then people come up with all these kind of, uh, what we typically call silly rumors. Mm -hmm. So, and this will not be the first time one in particular has happened yeah. relating to him. So my first reaction when uh, I pick up the news, and of course it came from the very close circles. I'm talking more about the political circle, okay. where a few, a few colleagues who had um, had naturally reach out to those of us who they feel should know. And uh, as soon as I had image, my natural instinct was to dismiss it. It's one of those other rumors again that are flying. Uh, but this one seemed to be kind of a bit persistent. And so the moment you get that persistent, you want to immediately reach closer mm -hmm. uh, in order to check a verification. Uh, so I did a normal thing, all the very close sources that I, that I know I could immediately get the information from. Um, the people who are within the household, uh, people who, um, those who drive the old man to, 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 to key places. You immediately want to reach out to them. And uh, I noticed I was getting a blank. Okay. And that got me worried because ordinarily you shouldn't get a blank yeah. uh, from those sources. So that was what started getting a bit concerned. You got concern, you suspicious, yeah. A bit concerned. Uh, so I reached out to two other places, two other uh, sources who, are, who work closely within the office. Mm. Uh, one I couldn't reach. The other person, the reaction made me believe that there was something yes. amiss. There was something I missed. What was the reaction? <laughs> you know, normally when uh, something is not true, uh, you dismiss it outright. Okay. But this time, no, that was not the reaction. The reaction was more like, Honorable, please, can I get back to you? Okay. Uh, immediately, I picked that up. I knew, I knew that there was, something, there was something going on wrong, something that is not right. 
something that's not right. And of course, um, uh, Zaneto, the daughter, uh, and I have had um, a very long-term relationship as well, throughout even the period that I've been with the dad. I mean, she has been the one I've been very, very close to, even long before she became an MP. So I tried to reach out to Zaneto as well immediately. And I saw that, no, it was difficult reaching out as well. So then I started knowing that, no, there's something really serious that is happening here. So I would say really it's, it came as a shock. I mean, the, the, one of the biggest shocks that you can, you, can never, you can never have. I never had a clue, a clue at all that um, anything of that, moment, of, that, of that nature was about to happen. How did you handle it? To be honest, uh, you believe it, but even till now, it still, it still sometimes feel as if maybe it was just uh, one of these things, but uh, the reality will come back and he'll be back. I still can't completely believe that he's gone up to now, even though I do understand uh, the nature of life. Mm -hmm. Life is pretty transient. Anyone can pass. But, uh, I mean, Jerome is so much larger than life. It's almost impossible to believe that he was going to be living soon. So, up to now, we say, really, it still hasn't really done. That's the truth I can tell you. It still really hasn't done. Uh, maybe it's my way of, uh, of uh, not wanting to maybe face up to it fully, Except that he truly is gone. Yeah. Really is gone. But uh, it's still pretty difficult to believe. That he's gone. Have you been in touch with the family ever since? Naturally, especially the daughter, yeah. Mm. Especially the daughter. Mm. What would you say, having worked closely with him, uh, is the biggest legacy um, of the former president? Um, I would say, really, um, we need to have a lot more people who would be thinking way beyond themselves and, and be totally consumed by their nation and by their people, especially starting from very young age. We don't seem to be having too many of that. It's almost like they are becoming endangered species. And that, for me, was the most important thing about Jerry Rollins. The fact that from a very young age, he was already that consumed about his country. I keep telling a lot of people, but uh, if you want to know who a person is, sometimes watch what a person does even from very young age. Mm -hmm. I mean, this was someone who, as early as 1977, and I think at the time he was just um, he was 40, born 47. So uh, by 1977, we're talking of maximum 30. By the age of 30, he was already consumed so much about his country that he decided already to name his firstborn, who was going to be born the following year, mm. 78. And the name he gave that child was a name that actually meant this person was totally consumed by his country. The name is Zaneto, it never means let the night come to an end. Uh, actually, I've had occasion to ask him, and he himself explains it, that he meant let the nightmare that had engulfed this nation mm. come to an end. That should tell you who he was. Uh, somebody who, who was thinking way beyond himself at that young age. Mm. He was thinking about his country, thinking about his people, felt that there was such a gloom that had consumed the nation that needed to be lifted. And often he called it um, a moral decay that he felt had fallen on the country. So I think for me, if there is anything that absolutely stands out, it is that, f that drive for nation to be lifted. Again, that led him even into leadership. Mm. And uh, throughout the period of leadership, he remained true to that commitment. But we must admit that a lot of people um, don't agree with his methods of moving the country forward, especially under his uh, military regime. So many people, given their experiences about the uh, harrowing experiences mm. they, they had at the time, and they've lived with it. For that reason, they, they don't agree with others who think the former president is um, someone who is a good person and his drive to lead the nation forward was a good question, all of that. What do you think about all of that? You know, 
uh, sometimes it's a bit easy, especially given um, uh, the about 30 year journey we've had since moving into constitutional democracy uh, to not to sometimes understand the context of the time. The things have always have to be looked at within a context. Mm -hmm. We're talking about somebody who was born in a generation of coups all over Africa. That was what it was. Uh, so for people born in that generation, that was what was happening. You need to understand them within that concept. And uh, that's why I mentioned earlier that so many coups were happening all mm -hmm. over Africa. But his coup was a completely different time. Others were doing coups largely because they just wanted leadership for themselves. But people got killed anyways. I agree. I agree. And, that's, and nobody, nobody will seek to justify uh, bloodshed or killing. But uh, uh, there, are, there are just sometimes things that happen. If you notice exactly the nature of what happened, especially in those days, you'll be surprised. I would say it actually took a certain level of leadership on his part to even l lower the level of anger that mm. was happening in the country. Mm. People wanted more blood. That's the truth. Yeah. People wanted far, 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 far more blood. And sometimes when you are a leader, uh, leading such a, a situation, you needed to have a certain strength to even hold back the quest and the desire for blood. Uh, so I'm not in any way saying that he was perfect or he, just, or he was just to have led necessarily the nature of, um, the, I mean, of, the, of what we had. Mm. But compared with what was happening all over Africa, uh, that absolutely was a great leader. That's why he's loved. He's loved all over Africa. Uh, a lot more people all over Africa will tell you they wish they had a kind of leader. Mm. I mean, at the time I was, I was, I was that young, uh, as I told you, schooling across the border in Togo, uh, I saw exactly the, what Ghana was in relation to what Togo, for example, was. Togo was far better than we were. We, they were far better than we were. A smaller country, but they were far better. Mm. I mean, young people in Ghana were doing shoe shine. The girls were doing prostitution across the border, not just in Togo, Benin, Ivory Coast, Nigeria. I mean, basically, we were laugh at. As a young person in Ghana, it was even, it was, it, we were shy to identify ourselves being a Ghanaian because that's the level to which we had sunk as a people. Mm. And he changed the course of, of this country. And Within a matter of 10 mm. years of his leadership, people from Togo, from Benin, from Nigeria, from Cote d'Ivoire were trooping to Ghana when it used to be the case before he came. So that is what leadership is about changing the destiny of your people. You're not perfect, but what he did was to really set us on a path that brought, if I had 10 years of his, first, of, of his rule as PNDC, at, at the end of 10 years, it was written on a big billboard, I think around 37 area, the decade, the decade that stopped the decay. And that mark really what happened so in So it this was country. a necessary evil. You Absolutely. Let's talk about the former president and the NDC. Mm -hmm. It was his party. He founded the party. But mm -hmm. it looked like um, there was an obvious drift between him and a lot of the party members. What was that all about? Actually, the truth of the matter, until he died, he was still pretty much adored by the party, especially the grassroots of the party. Uh, the grassroots did not agree with everything. Even when he was uh, the leader of the party, that was absolutely the leader. It's not every single thing he wanted that always got done. You understand? That's just yeah. the nature of it. As I told you, for example, I was working super close with him. There were certain decisions that even I did not agree with, no matter how much I love him and I agree with. It's just natural human nature that you don't agree with everything. So if you're talking about a party of millions of people, it's not possible that every single thing that he wanted will be necessarily uh, done by the people who every single person but in the it party. looked like it was more of a situation where when he criticized um, some issues going on in the party individuals in the party would attack him and he wasn't happy about that yeah but you know what the, um, the nature of politicking is that way uh, uh, some for example I I 
no matter how much I disagreed with him, I wouldn't come out in the open and take him on when even I disagree on certain things. Mm. It's just the nature of the relationship I had with him. It doesn't mean that I did not sometimes feel like screaming when he, for example, says certain things that I thought was totally not right. Mm. I, I felt differently. If I were one-on-one, -on -one, if I were to say, this one, no, 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 no. No matter how much you may disagree, uh, there are ways in which you can get it done because after all, you are the founder of the party. If you want things done, you can get them done. You can get them changed. So, but it's always been that, that person. I mean, he, he, if you feel strongly about things, you talk about them. So that one is something you couldn't take away from him. But to say that just because some individual took him on, it means the party as a whole, I don't think, I, 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 that, that, that's not the truth. That wasn't the case. That, that wasn't the case at all. I mean, he was somebody who continued to be loving the party, even though the party members who disagree with certain things, but they still love him. It's like having a father, you don't agree with everything he does, but you just love him because he's your father. That's really what it was. Were you a baby with the sharp teeth? <laughs> no, I was not. You weren't part not. of it. I, I couldn't. I couldn't. I couldn't because I couldn't because I'm just. Uh, I don't know. I'm, I've just been a devout, a devout uh, uh, mentee. No matter how much I disagree, there are certain things in public I wouldn't say. What did he mean by that, anyways? Well, I think it's what he meant that young people who were, who were attacking him to 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 sharply whenever he spoke. So he didn't want people to take him oh, on? Oh, no. He, he actually didn't say that in, um, in an angry tone. Mm. That was his way of sometimes, uh, I mean, making a jest and laughing at certain things that was happening. Uh, I think deep down, even though he knew that those, some of the young guys were really uh, doing very, like, a tough job on him, I'm sure deep down he kind of knew that these are people he would have loved to do some good job for him. So, because I used to be a baby with sharp teeth on his behalf when I'm dealing with the NP. You understand? Mm. So by this time, it was not being dealt with the NP, but being turned a bit against him. So naturally, it wasn't very pleasant. But I used to be a baby on his part who absolutely, I mean, like, uh, tore the NPP into pieces. Mm. In fact, his biggest battles, all he needed to do was to say, feel good, good to the job, and I was ready to do an absolute massive job on his behalf. So he quite understand the nature of this game. It's not every time that everybody will agree. Some people are not... Uh, the patient, so they naturally will react. But uh, he understood the nature of the. Yes, of the there the are game. actually suggestions that this little drift or rift uh, sort of pushed the former president closer to uh, your largest opponent, the MPP. I'm not. I'm not sure necessarily that was the that was the the issue, because drifts naturally will happen. There are there are people who who had some of the, should I call it, the most intense uh, um, adversarial relationship vis-a-vis mm -hmm. -vis him. And some of those people still, I mean, go even close to him even before he passed away. So yeah. it's the nature of the game that sometimes you are one moment, you're happy with A, another moment you're happy with B. Uh, as to exactly uh, what made him to maybe be, become a little more patient towards uh, President Akufuado. Uh, I've never unfortunately had the privilege of asking that. It's one thing I always wanted to ask him one-on-one mm. -on -one because I know exactly the nature of what he felt towards Nana Akufuado. I mean, okay. Akufuado was, was one of uh, absolutely, uh, if you call it, uh, he absolutely had no regard for Akufuado at all. President Rollins didn't I'm have I'm talking any. about like back in time. I mean, he had absolutely no regard for him. Back even in though, time. Even though, of course, I'm mean, talking about when, when, we, when I was super, super close to him, when we were in opposition, working, working to come back to office. But it changed. He never, he never did. Uh, I would say that, yeah, maybe he drifted. The nature of why it changed, I'm not sure. Mm. I cannot suspect Mrs. Rollins is the reason. I suspect Mrs. Rollins is the reason. But that's why? all I can say. Because why Mrs. would she be Because like Mrs. Rollins became antagonistic to the NDC. Mm. Uh, when, when she couldn't become the leader, she became antagonistic, broke to form her own party. And her party became much more of a party against NDC rather than a party that wanted power. And of course, in the nature of politics, uh, the enemy of your enemy becomes your friend. So she, she kind of became closer to Nana Kufuado. And so enemy of enemies uh, become friends. So I suspect that must be it mm. because of the wife. You worked the uh, and were close to the president for a very long time. Mm -hmm. What would you say is the one thing you will miss 
about him? Hmm. Uh, his laughter. His laughter? His laughter. Just his, his laughter or the he, whole humor? No, I'm, he's a, he's a, a lot of people do not know about his, uh, leave politics, everything out. He's one individual you literally could just be with and you just laugh and laugh and laugh endlessly. I remember often the two of us used to just like, just laugh and you see both of us in tears because we both, we both were the kind of people this one, we are really having a good laugh. Mm. We, we have you a lot cry. of tears coming through and just laugh, laugh. You crack, you crack jokes that will make you totally like, you are on the floor completely. Mm. That's the kind of person he is. He could, he could find funniest things in someone's uh, most tragic stuff. And uh, I think that's really what it was. Genuine, genuine human being. Genuine human being. That's, that's who he is. Um, take the politics out. Just one of them. A big soul, a grand soul. A genuine, genuine human being. Mm. That's who he is. Thank you uh, very much, Mr. Kuti, again. Uh, for taking time off your busy schedules to it's a pleasure share your experience with us absolutely really appreciate of a great of a great man great man that uh, I, I, it's my own prayer that a lot more of uh, rawnesses will be birthed uh, across the length and breadth not just of Ghana but in Africa genuine patriots who love their country despite their weaknesses they give everything they want in order to see a lifting up of their people. We need a lot more of Rollinses being born. Mm. Yeah. We hope for that and accept our condolences as well. It's a pleasure. And this has been another edition of our memorial series in honor of the late former president, Flight Lieutenant Jerry John Rollins, here on Ghana Web TV. Thank you for joining us. Our guest today has been Mr. Fifi Kwete, who was an advisor to the former president at some point in his life. Thank you out there for joining us in this edition. Uh, join us another time for another interesting conversation on the former president. My name is Wanda Ami Hagan. Honorable lecturers of the various faculties, your excellencies, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I think I prefer the lady. I prefer to be. <laughs> oh. I mean, this little warm food you want to enjoy, you want to come out. Blue.